Cataractcoach.com. Welcome to podcast number 11. Today with Samuel Maskett. Dr. Sam Maskett has really been a pioneer in the ophthalmology world, especially on the cataract side. We know the name from a lot of his innovations, a lot of the papers he's published, the research he's done, talking about how keratorefractive surgery affects IOL powers. He's done that. He's talked about negative dysphotopsia from IOLs, complicated reconstructive cases. Really, he's done it all. I also had the honor of being the last resident that Sam Maskett trained. Sam Maskett's always been a private practice, but he volunteered to teach the UCLA residents. And back in the year 2000, I was the very last resident that he taught. I jokingly say that maybe I broke Sam Maskett, but the truth is it was time for him to move on and do bigger and better things. And now that I retired last year from teaching residents at the same program, I understand why. It's time to have different chapters in life. And that's one of the lessons we'll talk about today. Anyway, check out the podcast. It's really amazing. I know you're really going to enjoy it. All right. So welcome to the cataractcoach.com podcast. And today my guest is one of my very important mentors, Dr. Sam Maskett. I first met Dr. Maskett when I was a resident at UCLA in the late 1990s, up to about the year 2000. And he showed me that you can have a tremendous amount of innovation in ophthalmology and leadership, but still do private practice. You can always do a combination of these things, and you don't have to relegate all the advancements in ophthalmology to the academic world, when in fact, most come from the private practice world. So he really served as an important mentor to me and the other thing that I thought was really impressive was you taught me a different way to operate. When I was a resident, when you're a resident, you assume that what you learn from your professors is that's all there is. They're teaching you everything. Whereas they're just teaching you the basics. And when you showed me how to do fake chop in 1999, you, you basically blew my mind. So welcome, Sam. A really big honor for me. Well, Uday, thank you so much for in, in, inviting me into this program of yours. You really do have a great service that's recognized worldwide. People look up to what you say and, and what you do. So I'm very happy to be part of this as well as to have been uh, a mentor for you. I know you, you teasingly say that uh, you broke me, in fact, that I, <laughs> I, st I stopped scrubbing with the residents after you. And, and the truth is, yeah. and uh, the reality is that you had a zeal for cataract surgery that you don't ordinarily see anymore. And to me, cataract was in and of itself, you know, the most important part of ophthalmology given the volume. And when you think about what it does for patients, I don't understand how people couldn't have a zeal for it. But in those days, when you were training, LASIK was, was really in its, yeah. in its heyday. And residents, all they wanted to talk about, all they wanted to know, really was was LASIK and or ophthalmic plastics. And I almost took that as a personal affront. Um, but you, you had a real zeal for it. I'll never forget your response when I showed you capsule staining on that white cataract. That was even before Tripan Blue. I think it was ICG green, right? It was ICG. Yeah. Uh, we were in Olive View, which is a general county hospital, but they had it in the urology department. And we found it. Yeah. Uh, and I showed you how to dilute it. And it was like, you know, like watching you see sliced bread for the first time. It was truly amazing. You know, especially that county hospital. Yeah. Cataract surgery. You get a patient with a white cataract, and then your normal vision the next day, that is the best magic trick in all of medicine. Yeah. To make the blind people see normally in such a beautiful, elegant surgery. So you're right. I fell in love with cataract surgery. Right. It was a different world, too. And then well, after my residency, there weren't fellowships like yours. You offer a fellowship now where you can get a tremendous amount of experience in complicated cataract surgery, anterior segment reconstruction. That just didn't exist at the time. No, it didn't exist. Um, and, you know, I always had a, a, um, a zeal, so to speak, uh, or an attraction to the very challenging cases. And so learning the techniques and, and or establishing the techniques was very, very special. So um, over the years, I did have a lot of those type cases get referred to me. Um, and then I was blessed to have Nicole Fram join me and she had that amazing zest as sure. well. And she's incredibly talented. So passing the baton to her was not, has not been a difficult challenge at all. And so it goes on and on. And then a few years ago, she said to me, you know, we really should have a fellowship. When, we needed to establish a foundation to fund it and on and on. 
So for my 70th birthday, she and my sons gave me the structure, the paperwork of a foundation. I like to say it was the worst birthday present I ever <laughs> received because the work has been unending. Yeah. I mean, it's almost, I'm going to be 80 in two months, and so it's been 10 years of a lot of work. I am so proud of what the foundation does. So we have Marissa Schoen, who was chief resident at Wills um, last year. She's our fellow now, and she's superb, and she's learning how to do these, these cases, and the foundation uh, supplies the patients for her. So uh, it's been a, a labor of love, but a lot of labor. Yeah, it's fantastic to have a fellowship like that to get experience in these tough cases. In LA, you were, for the longest time, you were the one for tough cases. Even I remember starting practice, and you know, only had maybe a 500 case under my belt, saw a really complicated case, and I just thought, eeh, let me send this to Dr. Maskin. It'd be a lot easier. Yeah, I, I just, I love the opportunity to do those cases. Um, now that I don't do surgery anymore, I voluntarily stopped at 75. One of my mentors, Bob Sinsky, sure. said to me, you have to stop when you're 75. He said, otherwise, if you have trouble with cases and what have you, with age, they'll blame your age on it, you won't be able to defend your age, mm. and you'll be miserable in, in retirement. So uh, I stopped uh, at what I think was the top of my game. In fact, when I scrub with Marissa, I still, I'm, I'm thrilled that I can still do it, but uh, you know, I, I would not recommend people be operating you know, beyond certain ages. Uh, I, you know, I, I use a lot of sports metaphors. Um, I'm old, so my baseball <laughs> heroes were Sandy Koufax and, sure. Willie, and Willie Mays. Sandy was the best pitcher I ever saw, and Willie was the best all-around player I ever saw. But Sandy, because of arth an arthritic left elbow, retired at 31. He won 27 or 28 games in his last year. Um, and, you know, he's been a hero. There isn't, during baseball season, there isn't a week go by. He's in his 80s now. Sure. There isn't a week that goes by where he's not mentioned in the sports pages. Willie Mays, on the other hand, stayed till he was 42, which in those days was really ancient for a baseball play. He retired in 73. And uh, he really didn't distinguish himself. He dropped a couple of fly balls in the 73 World Series when he was finishing his career with the Mets. And people don't revere him as they really should sure. because he stayed too long at the dance. Well, I wanted to be Koufax. I didn't want to be Mays. So I, you know, I stopped at 75. And um, now Nicole takes all those cases and does a great job of them. Yeah, I took your advice to heart with that as well. So I actually, last year, 52, mm -hmm. retired from teaching residents. Mm -hmm. So I retired from the academic duties. The same hospital where you attended me, all of you, UCLA Med Center, was the same one where I taught for 22 years after residency and became chief there. But mm -hmm. yeah, after I proved kind of what I wanted to, I made sure I retired at the very, very peak of my game. And I think that that's a real smart move. You know, I, I think we don't realize how our skills and our cognition degenerate with time. Uh, we're not aware of it. Um, this is becoming a very important subject in ophthalmology today. There was a recent uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times, Would You Trust a 100-Year-Old Physician? Mm. And we now have, we have a real aging, not only of the population, sure. but our, our profession as well. Um, I happen to chair the Senior Ophthalmologist Committee of the Academy. Okay. One is automatically a Senior Ophthalmologist when they turn 60. 60? 60. 60. You're getting it. We, <laughs> oh boy. we now represent 43% of the Academy. Oh, wow. That's increasing. So we have an aging uh, of, of our profession and we are not replacing ourselves as fast as we are retiring. We graduate 450 residents a sure. year in this country. We're retiring a little faster than that. And while we're on the subject, one of the reasons that people retire um, is musculoskeletal uh, diseases. Um, ophthalmologists, about 15% retire early because of oh, like cervical disc disease, cervical or lumbar disc, and and other MSDs, wrist issues. <laughs> right, <laughs> sit right. up straight. Sit yeah. up straight. Sit up straight. No, it's true. So these have become very important subjects to me, and, and they really go along. Uh, I don't want to get into the subject of, sure. of wellness and burnout, 
but it's all part of that as well. So we have to keep our physicians working longer because our population is aging and we're retiring too soon. Right, it seems like every year we're doing a higher and higher volume of cataract surgery in the That's US, correct. now four million a year. And now we have fewer people to do it, a lot more ophthalmologists working part-time. A lot of the younger generation is very smart figuring out a work-life balance that maybe it's not all about work. A mistake I made early on, working six days a week. Um, you know, times, people, and issues change. When I was in training, we measured our value by how hard we worked. Correct. Yeah. Who had the most admissions the night before? Who could brag, you know, is that red badge of courage? Who did the most volume of surgery? Exactly. Yeah. Um, rather than thinking about ourselves. And while we're on the subject, we'll touch a little bit more on ergonomics. Nobody ever looked at how I was working with instruments sure. and said, gee, you know, you should be sitting this way or what have you. Um, it was never a concern for our physical well-being or our mental well-being. Well, that's changed, and I think that's changed for the better. I mean, I used to work 80 hours in a row. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you know, when I was an intern. Uh, at Albert Einstein, it was disaster. Um, but we did it, and there was a trade-off. The harder you work, the more you learned. Sure. Uh, that was always, the, that was the trade-off. You learn uh, by working. And so I, I guess I didn't object. Also, if we go back a long time ago, the physician was in a very special place in society. We were highly respected for our caring, the amount of work we did, etc. Um, a lot of that has changed as we've gone to the corporatization of medicine. I, I don't want to. I, I wanted to talk <laughs> about cataract. I don't want to talk about the, sure. you know, the, the 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 bad issues of the day, as it were. But it, I mean, it's changing times. Yeah. I mean, even when I was a resident, we took in-house call, right. and the first our, mm -hmm. our PGY two, our first year residents, we didn't want to do every fourth night, right. so we just do a week at a time. I just go to the hospital on Sunday, and I wouldn't leave till the next Sunday. And take off for the entire week. Yeah, but people with families, you know. No, of course. We, we, when I was at, at Einstein, we, we did this weekend on where you'd come in Saturday morning and you don't go home till Monday night. Uh, and the only advantage you got out of that, at the end of that week, you had two nights off. Yeah. So you could actually sleep in your bed one morning. <laughs> <laughs> you could have a little bit of a life. Right, exactly. No, it's a tough balance, and I think the tough part we're getting into now is we're doing a higher volume of surgery. Each surgeon's going to have to do more and more volume. I think we may need to train more ophthalmologists. Well, um, that's obviously a complicated issue. There's, too. We, well, it's a very complicated issue, but there's no question that we have and will have an increasing shortage, a shortfall in the amount of physicians across the board, and ophthalmologists in any of those particular specialties that deal with the aging. Sure. Right? And we, I mean, that's, cataract. you know, give cataract, glaucoma, macular disease, I mean, that's who we are. Um, so yeah, we, we um, you know, the amount of trainees really comes from government funding. Yeah. And when the government decides uh, we need to train more ophthalmologists, we will. The concern, of course, is that we have uh, no shortage of people who want to compete with us to do the cataract surgery. And we are outnumbered by optometry yeah. by two to one. Um, do you think we'll get to the point where you have a non-physician doing interoperative surgery? Absolutely. Really? I have no doubt in my mind. Um, I think the more and more automated we become, look, Uday, it takes a long time to train us. It's very expensive to train us. Yeah. And the thing that really surprises me is that very few residency programs actually test you for dexterity. That's a, exactly. Right. In the old days, if you wanted to go to dental school, you had to carve Corby. a piece of chalk, right? If you wanted to go to pharmacy school, you had to roll a suppository. Even um, ENT had the soap carvings. Yeah. Uh, but in ophthalmology, where, where dexterity is everything. Paramount. Right. Um, it's not It's not tested for. Also, binocularity. Yeah. Stereoscopic vision. Yeah, exactly. Nobody, well, there are some programs that do. I remember in my days in training in New York, there was a very prominent ophthalmologist had about a 90 diopter XT, prison <laughs> diopter XT. Right. It's fixable. I fit, well, I just, you know, and you, he was way out here. Big practice in Brooklyn. Very successful man. Uh, but again, we weren't doing microsurgery in those yeah. days, right? I mean, I started microsurgery as a resident 
but the the attendings hadn't done that, so maybe it didn't matter for him. Well, part of it too is the yeah. world we live in. So I even asked when I was involved with UCLA for many many years, I said we have this surgical simulator, mm -hmm. and this is back when we were doing in person interviews of the med students. I said we have a surgical simulator. Can we just put every applicant on like that quick ten minute you know mm -hmm. trial and just see how they do? See, do they have any? Yeah, absolutely. We were told resoundingly, no. Right. It, you can't do that. It's not fair. Well, the it's long and short is you should do that. Because getting back to the point I raised, we are very time consuming and very expensive to train. Sure. Right? I think all the training we go through, uh, and people may not have been tested for their, their skills, let alone their ability to think on their feet when something goes wrong. I, I had a concept years ago that with remote watching, a trained surgeon could watch eight or nine cases simultaneously that you could train, you would search for very, very dexterous young people, sure. high school, college students, and that you could teach them. You may do it based on merit, Sam? Yes, <laughs> and, and, right, and you could, you could have these one-trick yeah. ponies, yeah. right? Well, all they could do was routine cataract surgery. And they could, and you could watch. Right now, if something happened, you know the good thing about cataract surgery is you can stop at almost any point. Sure. And Have transfer that over. Yeah. exactly. So that that was a thought that I had. Um, well, one of the things I talked to Tom Odie on the podcast, yeah. and he says, yeah. it takes two years to train mm. a fighter pilot, right. but thirteen to train an ophthalmologist. <laughs> Wait a minute. Right. No, that, that's, uh, and I agree with Tom 100% on that. Yeah. So we're expensive, we're time consuming, um, but now we are being replaced a lot by technology. We're no longer physicians, we're providers, and you know that whole game. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I was uh, a medical student, now I graduated 55 years ago, I graduated medical school in 1968. Um, the cardiologist was king. Yeah. And I don't mean queen either, because there were no women that I knew who were cardiologists in the New York scene. So the cardiologist was king, because he could hear these little clicks and these little rubs mm -hmm. and things like that with his Littman stethoscope that we mortals couldn't, tell. couldn't hear. What? What are you talking about? <laughs> Today, the cardiologist never sees the patient. I mean, all the automated okay. devices, cardiologist looks at the printouts, oh, okay, you know, we'll do this, that. So we, to a great extent, we've been replaced by technology. And you know robotics are coming. Sure. Um, I forget his name again uh, at uh, UCLA. Uh, J.P. Hubs, he actually took yeah. a sabbatical, and yes. I'm actually working with him and his company, for okay. Horizon Surgical, to okay. do so robotic they, surgery. Right, and I've seen it. Uh, plus, there's, there's a, a European uh, machine now that combines FACO and FEMTO, and it's, there's more automation sure. in it. And we know that surgery will be automated to a great extent. Plus, we also don't know. Remember, all the machines today are trying to mimic what we do with traditional FACO. Sure. But the day the machine comes along it that supplants traditional yeah. FACO, then I think it'll be more and more automation, and I don't think you're going to need 13, 14 years to train an ophthalmologist. Wow. You but kind of shortcut that. I'm it, sorry. Yeah, no, another thing is, you know, not all ophthalmologists have to be surgeons. I was interviewing a residency program director and she was explaining that like, yeah, she, there are residents who she says you should pro strongly consider doing a UVI to subspecialty, mm -hmm. neuro-ophthalmology, a non-surgical subspecialty. Uh, well, listen, uh, as an example in Germany, sure, uh, only about eight or 10% of ophthalmologists actually do surgery. The others are office-based. In fact, it's almost, I, I, was, um, I was the monitor for a, a U.S. company developing an implant, um, a lens implant for Europe, and I went over to the surgery center in, in Munich area, and I said, well, when do we see the pre-ops? And he says, we don't. We don't. I said, well, when do we see the post-ops? We don't. We don't. <laughs> I said, then how can we know, you know, how the patients do? Um, but so uh, that's the way it works in other parts of the world where they're kind of like surgeons who operate all day, every day. That's sure. all they do. Um, and, you know, I think people are jealous of those. But, you know, justice is when everyone is doing what they should do. Right. Right. I mean, for, for, yeah. for years I worked with an older ophthalmologist just outside of LA, mm -hmm. who lined up, he lined up all the patients, I'd just go there in the morning, he's already seen them all, mm -hmm. and I would, the first time I'm seeing the patient is the day of surgery, 
And then he sees the post-op and literally never sees the patient again. Right. And there was something that, you know, we were able to do a huge volume of surgery very efficiently because of that. Yes, and it, the only question is whether it's best for the patient sure. not to know their surgeon. And that's something that I struggle with when I see the way practices are more and more now where the cataract surgeon is seeing the patients hardly other than uh, in the own in fact, I was talking with a colleague the other night about a different type of surgeon, a, an orthopedic surgeon. He said, the only way you're going to see him after surgery if you wake up during the procedure. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't know if that's really the best sure. way to go. Uh, in my view, my whole view of medicine is, comes down to this one credo. If it's good for the patient, then it's good for the doctor good for the profession sure. and good for the industry for sure. and if it's not good for the patient then nothing not, else matters I, that's exactly so I don't really know and I don't even know how to study that question yeah uh, but it is an important question because at the end of the day if it's not about the patient it it's, really it's not medicine yeah I know for sure but you know I, I'm an old horse um, I you know people may differ with my philosophy but that's what I think I think this is the right answer too. I give the same treatment of patients that I'd want to receive. So I actually see all my patients pre-op. I actually see them all post-op. Right. Because and if it was my eye, my surgery, that's kind of what I'd want. And, and you, you, you brought right to the head, exactly. It really behooves you at some point in your life to be a patient. Sure. Because then you really understand what's important to the patient. Again, I'm old fashioned. That's yeah. what I believe in. Um, you know, you know, I'm, you, you can send me to the you know, send me to the glue factory, but that's you know, <laughs> <laughs> that that's that's how I was trained. That's my philosophy about that. No, I think it works the best, and patients can tell. Mm -hmm. You know, patient when you, patients can tell that you really care about them. I think that's far more important to them than how smart you are, or how good of a surgeon you are. That, that it's all touch. part. It, it's important when things don't go well. When things go well, um, I don't think it matters. But when things don't go well, you then need a partnership with sure. that patient. Whether they're unhappy with a diffractive optic IOL, whether you got a refractive surprise, whether they have a serious surgical complication, your ability to deal with the relationship with the patient makes it better for them, better for you, less chair time, and less risk of you know medical legal action or things of that nature. What are some pearls? The majority of our cataract coach fans and podcast listeners are actually mm -hmm. ophthalmologists in their thirties and forties. Yes. So what are some pearls in dealing with a patient who has complications after surgery or has that refractive surprise and they're not happy? Yeah. yeah. Well, the most important thing is a very careful pre-op evaluation of the patient. I like to say that if the patient, let's say for example, a patient has an epiretinal membrane and you've not discussed it, not determined it, not discussed mm -hmm. it, and post-op and you've put in a diffractive optic IOL, post-op they're not seeing well and you have an unhappy person and then you discover, oh, patient has macular pucker, patient had it preoperatively. If you told that to the patient, then it's their problem. If you didn't tell that to the patient, it's your then it's your problem. So very often um, people will miss particularly ocular surface disease, mm -hmm. dry eye problems, things of that nature, and they may miss some subtle macular disease. So even though you may not be reimbursed for doing a MAC OCT on everyone or everyone you're considering for let's say a premium type or presbyopic type of IOL, it's worth the time to do it. Sure. It's worth your time to evaluate it. So the most important thing is to know everything you can about that patient and let the patient be your partner. You know, Mrs. Jones, I don't think you're a good candidate for X, Y, or Z lens because you have this comorbidity. Uh, and I think that's important for the patient to know. So once you've established that you know what's going on with them, they feel better. Yeah. And any problem that does come up because of it, you're then a team. You're not adversarial. You never want to be adversarial with a patient in trouble. I mean, that's, that's a great yeah. point. I used to teach the residents, yeah. if you predict something ahead of time, yeah. oh, you have an ERM, mm -hmm. you may get macular edema after surgery, mm -hmm. you're, a, you're a smart doctor for predicting it. But if you don't tell them, yeah. you're a bad doctor for causing the problem. Exactly. It's the same thing. It's either their problem or your problem, right. depending upon what you do as a physician. So the time you spend 
with a patient preoperatively is going to save you so much chair time postoperatively if you're aware of the issue and the patient will know what can happen. Another thing I would advise young people, um, I don't know where it ever came to be that cataract surgery, or any surgery for that matter, was a horse race. When it comes to, you know, maybe cardiac, thoracic, or even abdominal surgery, yeah, the longer the patient's under, sure. the more things can go wrong, what have you. But in cataract surgery, the difference between two minutes or three minutes intraoperatively, like it, yeah, yeah the, the time that you save po with dealing with postoperative problems by spending an extra minute or so in surgery doing it carefully, I always tried to make every case perfect. Of course. And I never did. I always said, maybe I could have done this a little bit, maybe I could have done that a little better. But that was the idea. I was challenging myself. Oh, one other thing, all right? As you gain a reputation, supposing you're really talented, you're building a very big practice, patients are beating down the door to get to you, remember this. You're only as good as the next person mm -hmm. for whom you care, all right? Forget your press clippings, all right? <laughs> no, you, you can't, of course, you can't rest on your laurels. It's the next no, case. It's exactly. You're only as good as the next patient for whom you care. So our cataract coach fans will realize that a lot of what Dr. Maskett says, you've heard me say before, where do you think I learned it from? Hello. He plagiarized it. <laughs> no, borrowed. Oh, borrowed okay, it. Okay. No, it's, I mean, no these are amazing <laughs> points. In fact, one of the things you said it went very quickly, but let's repeat it. You don't want the patient to feel like they're an adversary to you. You have to be on the same team. And that is yeah. so critical, especially mm -hmm. if they're complications post op Yeah, exactly. And th th I think that's most true. But one thing we also didn't talk about here is consumerism. When you're doing insurance-based cataract surgery, um, where there's no decision the patient's going to have, well, you've discussed with them whether they want distance or what have you, but it's a monofocal lens, um, you're not doing femtosecond laser, you're not doing intraoperative aberrometry, no money is changing hands for the surgery other than the third party payer, the insurance based. Um, there's a different mindset on the part of the patient. Once the patient reaches into their pocket sure. and they're paying for whatever service or device that you're providing, they've become consumers. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very different relationship. So bear in mind that if they're not happy, they say, well, I've paid you X thousands of dollars for this, sure. and I'm not, you know, I can't see 2010 and, and J1 plus <laughs> under all lighting conditions, you know, day or night, and the colors are perfect, and I never see reflection. Any, you know, if, some may say a patient's entitled to feel that way. I don't know if that's true, but some do feel that. They feel entitled for the, because of their money. So bear that in mind. And I think, by the way, that consumerism also keeps a lot of surgeons from using toric lenses, mm. which is really a shame because patients really yeah. benefit from toric lenses. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So I think some surgeons uh, either don't want to go down that road and deal with the expectations and the entitlement that patients may feel. But the point you raise about um, a team that's why I always feel when, if you see a, uh, I remember seeing a patient one day post-op from a, a multifocal and everything was perfect. I mean, it, everything was perfect. She was 2015, J1, and I said to her, I'm going to have to take that lens out. Because not only did she tell me about halos, she told me what she saw inside the halos. Oh, so, <laughs> I didn't know there was stuff in the halos. Well, she did. <laughs> <laughs> so she brought me a litany of description of what she was seeing one day post up. And it took her three years to finally say, you're right, I have to take that lens out. But we were a team all the time. We were a team. And so I've never forgotten her because... Um, I explained what was going on. She was willing to listen. She was willing to learn. She was willing to live with it. But after three years, <laughs> she said, okay, I'm done. And then it was a little more challenging taking that lens out. And while we're on that subject, all right, removing IOLs is much less difficult than people think. Sure. Um, it's, it, you just have to use basic surgical principles, be patient, um, understand why the lens is stuck, 
how to unstick it. And, and by and large, you can remove, I mean, even 10 years out, sure. you can remove lenses. Um, and on that subject, uh, we published just recently uh, a paper on the prognosis postoperatively for patients who had open versus po uh, closed capsules and exchanging IOLs just for optical considerations, uh, dysphotopic, wrong power, opaque IOLs, no pathology. And we found that the postoperative complication rate was identical. Oh, whether or not they'd have prior capsulotomy. Yeah, yes, exactly. Wow. The only significant difference between the two groups is that in the patients who had open capsules, well, they wound up with lenses that were either captured or in the sulcus with iris suture fixation. We were less accurate in their optical outcomes. We had sure. myopic errors in those patients rather than the ones with a closed capsule bag-to-bag -bag exchange. But we didn't have an increased complication rate. If you know how to well, manage that's so that, interesting. I would not yeah. have predicted that. No one would have predicted it. But we did that study because over the years, I've taken care of so many people sent to me unhappy with multifocals. Um, after, of course, the first the first thing the surgeon does is assume the capsule is the problem. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so I got a custom, and we developed a protocol for how to do it. And uh, I, I wish I could give you the numbers. That, that paper is just out in JCRS. But what are, the, what are some of your protocols for preventing, yeah. let's say, vitreous prolapse as you're dissecting or taking the old lens out? There isn't a pro, pro you know, you have to do a vitrectomy. Yeah. Um, and you have, are you doing it pars plana or limbal approach? Most often it's pars plana. It depends upon, you have to play it as it lies. So cutter, yeah. pars plana, infusion at the limbus? Yes, most typically. Um, I, I'll give you an alternative example. I had a patient who was sent to me with a very, very bad Z syndrome with a crystal sure. lens. And she'd already had her anterior and posterior caps, I mean, lased out to her, you, know, you could barely see them. Um, there was vitreous all around. Oh boy. But the lens was really blocking access. So I did that as an anterior approach. Mm. Took out the vitreous that way. Of course, assisted by stain with triamcinolone. Um, then you have to cut those lenses out and then do a little more anterior vitrectomy. But then she wound up with a sulcus placed um, three piece silicone IOL sewn to the iris, and she did great. Probably LI61? Yes. That's, uh, that's, that's your go to that's fastball. A, oh, that's a fastball. That's a great sulcus lens. Yeah. So, yeah, and, you got to play it as it lies. You don't know. And, and the approach. By the way, it is the only IOL that is approved for sulcus implantation. In this country. Oh, I did not know that. The only IOL. That's right. Uh, it's labeled for sulcus So six millimeter silicon optic. Yes. Zero spherical vibration and yes. then slight tilt of the haptic optic junction, little angulation. Exactly. Oh. So you put if there's good sulcus support, you still suture to the iris so it doesn't rattle around. Exactly. I, um, you know, when people say to me, "Well, I just put it in the sulcus," I said, "It in time it'll decenter, and if it moves, it'll chafe." You really want to fixate it. If you can't do optic capture, which is the best way sure. to manage it, um, then uh, we suture the haptics to the to the iris. Um, and I always say, you'll see. And, <laughs> and it's pretty much true. They'll move. You know, unfortunately, we lost our 14 millimeter yeah, uh, the lens. Star, the star, you. yeah, with the 6.3 optic. That was a great device for the sulcus. Um, and those, I don't think you always had to suture those because those 14 millimeter had bigger. Been, yeah, on, those were on the, the the low power lenses. That was the AQ 5010 V series. Crime, crime, we lost that. Yeah, it was a great, great series. The the uh, 2010 and the 5010. So wow, you've done a lot of publications mm -hmm. in this space that are really changed the way we operate. Like my, one of my favorites from you is recently is dead bag syndrome. Oh God, which is a whole, whole other topic. <laughs> Any any pros there, and why are we seeing more and more of this seemingly? I think you just asked the most important question. You know, it, I think of this almost in a way like HORV. I mean, for years we were either infused... Hemorrhagic occlusive yeah. retinal vasculitis. Right. If you've never seen a case, you don't want to. Yeah. Um, it's, it's disastrous to have to routine surgery to see the retina just destroyed by HORV, um, uh, ostensibly uh, due to intraocular bank. Um, so many eyes had vank for so many years, was never seen. I don't know why something changed and all. Maybe the way they prepared the vank of mice. Then, or we don't know. Yeah. We don't know. And you know, there's the smoking gun there, but there still isn't an absolute. I don't think Coke's postulates 
all right, were, were fulfilled. Now, we're facing a very similar thing with the dead bag. I, I described that term uh, when I first saw a patient easily 20 years ago, if not more, wherein I noticed that the capsule leaflets didn't fuse. Hmm. And that the, the capsule, the anterior capsule, instead of undergoing that fibrometaplastic change and become white, stayed, it looked as though you, you just did the surgery. Um, and I watched that patient for a number of years, stayed that way. But that patient had, some, that patient had a white mature cataract. And so I thought maybe there was some oncotic damage sure. to the LECs, killed the LECs, and that's why that bag stayed that way. Then a few years later, I was sent, in fact, it was a cardiologist who had a dead bag that, you know, wasn't a white cataract in the beginning, and it was just, the bag was just disintegrating. So, you know, maybe 20 and 15 years ago, I saw only a couple of cases. And then I started to see a couple more. And so I spoke to a few colleagues about sure. it. Uh, Jason Jones got sure. really excited about it. Um, uh, a couple of other people, maybe Alan Crandall. And um, all of a sudden, they started seeing patients. Now, all of us, now it's like a hot topic. Right. Everyone wants to get on it. Um, you didn't let me in on your paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me just, for those of you who aren't familiar, haven't seen a dead bag, this is a situation which a long-term post-operative patient has a capsule that looks almost virginal, as though you just did the surgery, but the capsule starts to degenerate. And if it degenerates in the periphery, the zonular fibers go along with it, sure. the lens will decenter. If it degenerates more centrally or at the equator or what have you, the haptics will start to feed through sure. the bag. So the bag disintegrates with or without the zonular apparatus. Nobody knows the cause. It's been seen with every type of lens out there. Um, it's, I mean, just recently a case came back to us. I operated on this man in the mid 1990s. Oh, wow, long um, ago. And came back to Nicole for lens exchange. It's almost 30 years ago this patient had surgery. What we don't know um, is whether the patient had a normal post-operative response, they developed some PCO or they developed some capsule fibrosis, and then it went away, the cells died over the years, sure. or if the patient looked like that from day one, you where they know. never developed. We don't know. Um, this patient that I did 30 years ago, I don't think this patient had intracameral antibiotics. Maybe he did. Um, we're working very hard to get those records. Um, and I hope we do, because some people have said, well, maybe it's intracameral anesthetic, intracameral antibiotics. I'm trying to look and see whether I did him top. I started topical uh, probably about 94, 93, 94. Yeah, you he, taught me topical. <laughs> yeah, so he was done a little bit yeah, after that. For sure. Um, I don't know whether he was topical, whether he had intracameral a an antibiotics, intracameral anesthetic. Is there an age-related thing too? Is the older patients more likely? Absolutely yeah. not. No. No. Back to the, so I think there are two types. Sure. There's the white cataract in which there may have been, um, you know, a dilutional sure. death, so to speak, aqueous imbibed, um, killing those LECs. Uh, I did a young woman's surgery maybe nine or ten years ago in her young 30s. Um, she had that white cataract. She was done routinely. Her capsule has never, never changed since the first day. But her lens hasn't decentered either. Mm, interesting. So yeah. Her fellow eye was not white, had a PSC or something. Sure. And that underwent the usual post-operative changes where you see a subcapsule LEC proliferation. And bear in mind, I clean LECs extensively. I'm a firm believer in that. And capsule polishing. Right. That's what I say. Yeah. And the reason, a lot of reasons I do that. But having done that, um, I don't think that's the cause. Because here's a young woman, one eye dead bag, one eye live bag, but she had a white cataract in the sure. bag. So we'll keep an eye out then for these dead bags in our patients. If I have one, I promise I'll refer them to you just so you can add it to your database. Well, the other thing what we're doing is we're working with Liliana Werner, 
on Utah and Nick Mamlis sure. up at Utah. Um, you know, that's where the real pathology of IOLs uh, is centered. Lab, sure. and, and what they do is really tremendous up there. So Liliana keeps the more specimens we send, um, and it's, an, it's, it's like an, it's an epidemic. Sure. And I don't know why they're all of a sudden showing up, although when you increase awareness of a condition, all of a sudden, sudden you, find it, you more more. find it, exactly. For sure. It may be that, just like the HORB thing. Sure. Right? Tell me a little bit more about your, your pathway up on your journey. Yeah. I know you trained on the East Coast and something about California tracked you over. How did that all go? Oh, God. You know, I, I, I always feel guilty in not having a specific set of plans for how I was going to run my life, all right, either personally or professionally. Sure. To a great extent, I've let life happen to me. Um, I trained in New York, and in fact, my chief was one of the very, very first implanters in the United States. Of IOLs? Yeah, of IOLs. So I saw them as a resident. Uh, so we're talking, I was a resident from 69 to 73. So a lot of our young ophthalmologists may not know, right. there were huge controversies about putting IOLs in eyes. Right. Huge. Massive. Massive. But my passion actually in those days or it morphed when I was a senior resident into strabismus because we had this fascinating orthoptist who had trained at Columbia Presbyterian where Phil Knapp, now probably nobody knows who Phil Knapp was, there was a time when there were four really major strabismus programs in the United States. There was Gunter von Norden in Houston, there was Marshall Parks in Washington, and, and um, uh, Art Jampolsky on the West Coast, and Phil Knapp in New York. They were the four horsemen. They would, well, she had trained, Columbia had a very big orthoptic program that he oversaw, um, and she got me excited about strabismus, and I went and spent six months with him. Wow. And I just loved it. I just loved it. So I then had to do two years in the military. My second year was in Philadelphia where we had um, a training program. And because I, I had power, all the strabismus cases from the surrounding small clinics were referred in. So the residents, they were doing six, eight strabismus cases a week. Wow, that's big so, yeah, And yeah, and I had, I had a lot of experience. By serendipity, we took, shortly after that, we took a vacation to California. And I went to Big Sur and I said, oh my God, this is the most beautiful place <laughs> in the world. It's gorgeous. And I said, what the hell is wrong with me? Why am I living in New Jersey? <laughs> so we moved. We just like lock, stock, and barrel. Lock, lock, with six and eight-year-old boys, um, a friend of mine out here found me. said, there's somebody out in the valley who wants to leave. He has a part-time practice. It's only two years old. Uh, he, he opened a few practices when he finished, and he wants to get rid of this office. You go there. I said, okay. So I paid him $4,000 for his phone and his records. And, and his furniture, right? not his equipment. Um, and I opened the office wanting to do strabismus. Sure. Because I had just come out of the military, and that was, that was my passion. But I didn't have training in pediatric ophthalmology. Um, I just had extra training in strabismus. And the local pediatric ophthalmologist told all the pediatricians that it was malpractice to oh send the boy. patient to me. He was a little bit aggressive. A little bit. A little bit aggressive. So even though I was teaching it at the Stein, I was scrubbing with the residents on strabismus cases. Uh, actually, I was mostly at the VA in those days, the Wadsworth VA, when I first came out. And I had some, uh, Tony Arnold's one of my residents. Sure. I had some terrific people who, who I was working with. Um, and I just wasn't getting really, I, I was building a general practice, but I couldn't get the strabismic referrals that I wanted. Well. Right around that time, this is the late 70s, one of my mentors was a man by the name of Murray Weber, who was, I don't know if you ever knew Murray. Murray really was the first one in California to, to do implants. Oh. Um, he, in 77 or so, he got a FACO machine at West Hills Hospital where I was working. And I saw- This is before any university bro, had, yeah. had a FACO machine. Right, and I saw what he was doing. I said, this is exciting. And it happened to be that this is the epicenter, or particularly Orange County, but Southern California, is the epicenter for all innovative cataract surgical yeah. tools. 
I mean, all IOLs were essentially made in, in Southern California, fake omission, all of this stuff. So um, I watched Murray, and I started to get fascinated by it, got involved with some of the companies, and then went to watch Dick Kratz. Sure. And he was a master not only at doing FACO, he was a master at everything. <laughs> I went fishing with him. He fished like he did FACO. Every movement was the elegant. Ballet. It was a ballet. It was, it was elegant. It really was. So he became a hero, and he became a mentor. Uh, and so uh, I learned to do FACO maybe 79 or so, around, around that time, and started doing it then. Now, because at that time, fewer than 5% of surgeons were doing FACO, um, the companies would bring machines to me to sure. try and what have you. And I got involved in teaching FACO. Teaching, um, believe it or not, we had to teach YAG lasers in those days. There was uh, somebody, probably nobody knows, there was an ophthalmologist down in Orange County named Bill Maloney. Bill Maloney had also learned FACO from Dick Kratz, but Bill was a very shrewd guy. He could systematize anything. So he developed a program, a teaching program called Three Steps, Steps to, to FACO. Yeah, for sure. Three Steps to FACO. And he had it down to such, such a great a series of, of steps on how to do this. And he put together a faculty where we would go around maybe at least once, if not twice a month, to different cities on weekends teaching FACO. Wow. We'd have wet labs and we'd have lectures. And there was a, a certain faculty that came together to do this. Howard Fine was among them. Sure. Jim Davison was among them. Um, da David Dillman was among them. Mark Michelson was among them. Ultimately, Sherry Rowan joined the crowd. Alan Crandall joined the crowd. Um, oh, I, I don't want to leave anybody out, but I probably am. Uh, Bill Fishkind was involved in this. And we would come and we would watch each other teach and oh, talk nice. about it. We couldn't wait till the next meeting to see who's taking it to the next level. Oh. So we became a group very similar. If you're familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, sure. this was a group who all were very similar in age, all working in a similar environment, stimulating each other to raise that state Keep of raising the, the bar. And that's what we did. And that's how that, that's how all the small pupil stuff came about. Um, with Bobby Osher's input, that's where the astigmatism managed. Sure. That's where the zonular stuff came about. So while Osher didn't like what we were doing, he didn't think we should be teaching people who couldn't learn to do it, but the innovative stuff he was doing, we incorporated sure. into the curriculum. Because we all learned from Bobby as of well. Course, of course. So this group, plus Bobby, uh, are just like an outlier where the opportunity was there, we saw it, and we stimulated each other, and then we stimulated the industry to make better machines and better tools. So you just kept advancing it higher and, and higher. And that's why better. we have the MSTs, and that's why we have sure. all the, the, uh, you know, the laser companies. There's a marriage of technology and technician that's just, it's unmatched in cataract. I mean, you think about, I was doing intracaps as a resident. I was doing intracaps uh, in when I was first in practice, then extra cap and on to FACO. But think about that. We're talking about intracaps without lenses and with lenses to, you know, to what we do today. Yeah. And it's all within the span of my professional lifetime. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of advance in a very short time. But it happened because of this marriage, what I call the surgical industrial complex, from the better part of that of that terminology. What's interesting about this too is that it's uh, it's private practice doctors working with the industry, yeah. because a lot of people would think that no, it'd be more on the academic side. But uh, it seemed yeah. like at the time, at least, the academic side was quite lagging. The academic side was lagging for two reasons. Um, number one, tradition. Um, what we do is best. We've always done it this way. Exactly. We can't change. Exactly. Yeah. And also, as an example, uh, there was a time when I was working with Arthur Rosenbaum, who was chief sure. of pediatric ophthalmology at UCLA, to do the pediatric implants. 
Arthur got very, he became very clairvoyant that this was the way to manage a pediatric cataract. Um, and I was in, I had done some, so I wound up working with him. It took us a year and a half to get approval of the uh, Human Subject Protection Committee at UCLA to do this, where I was doing this in my practice. All right. So universities can have a lot of bureaucracy that slow things down along with an attitudinal, you know, sense. Uh, most of the major, major things in ophthalmology and cataracts. Certainly in cataract, cataract. Yeah. Well, look at Charlie Kelman. I mean, he was, <laughs> he was damned by <laughs> the academic institutions. I mean, um, Femto the same way. I mean, I can't think of too many things that actually came out of academics in cataract. Probably none of them. Um, OVDs did, I mean, they did come out of Harvard. Yeah, because that's where David Miller and, and um, um, Robert Stegman. Stegman was a fellow there at, um, at Mass Eye and Ear. So I'll give Mass Eye and Ear, and, and that's where Balash was as well. So I'll give Mass Eye and Ear the credit for <laughs> OVDs. For sure. but, but most things uh, have come out of the private sector. Right, I just want to tell our young audience that no matter what you do in your practice, you can end up in a, it's a complete private practice in a small town somewhere, you can have an impact in ophthalmology globally. Mm -hmm despite you being a solo practitioner in a small town? It all depends where your passion is. Right. Um, again, as we spoke before, many younger people are, they want a work-life balance. Ophthalmology may not be their passion. Not everyone, you know, has to have, you know, needs to be crazy about cataracts as you like and us. I might. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it may be to a certain extent a disease that yeah. we have. Um, as I was saying uh, off camera before, uh, during the heydays of uh, my practice, I didn't appreciate entertainment. I would sit in a movie, I would sit at the opera, sit at a play, and think about eyeballs. <laughs> you, and, I, and I remember coming up with, with a variety of things during, in fact, uh, going to concerts at Ambassador Auditorium in Pasadena. That's where the L.A. Chamber Orchestra used to play. I love chamber music, but I would sit there and think about eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> so we're basically, we're cuckoo for cataracts. <laughs> yeah, and it, if you are, yeah. the sky's the limit. You can do what you want to do. I used to keep in my freezer, I had a, a bag of cow eyes and pig eyes, had all sorts of stuff that I could, at the end of the day, I could go and practice this and try this and try that so that I never did a procedure on a patient that was the first time I was doing that procedure. I mean, my boys thought I was weird. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> you may have scared them away from ophthalmology, yeah. Sam. We always had a bag of eyeballs in my freezer. My I haven't gone that far yet, <laughs> but I do use the model eyes. Oh, yeah, but you've got the simuli, that, that wonderful right. device that Stuart Stoll makes. So, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. You, you don't need a freezer full of eyeballs. <laughs> How did you get to be in LA, your practice in LA? How did you get to be known as the go-to guy for a tough case, and how did you develop that? I think um, what happened, I, I, I don't like to use words that extol me in any way. Sure. But I think I developed prominence because I always believed in publishing. Sure. When I was a resident, um, I published 10 papers. It was some- well, I was a resident. As a resident. I think that was something that Somehow, I, I, that was, to me, the highest level thing you could do is publish. That may be, you know, not important today. Maybe it wasn't important. It was important to me. Sure. So I published a lot. So people, and I published related to cataract eventually. So I had that name, and then I would present at, um, I would get involved in ASCRS. And so I was put on the editorial board. The next thing that happened was they asked me to take the consultation section. So of I JCRS. would, yeah, of JCRS. So I would, and I would do. I was doing it once a month. I was doing them all, every, you know, all twelve issues, and so they were always complex cases, and people knew that I was interested in complex surgery. So I got a reputation for being interested in that, not necessarily being able to fix it, but being interested <laughs> sure. in it. But then, by my association with that other group of what I call outliers. Sure. And I really want to credit Bobby Osher, even though we didn't like that we were teaching people, but we, all, we incorporated a lot of what he taught. Um, so I learned by watching my fellow colleagues 
every month we'd go someplace and you know watch you know Howard Fine deal with a broken capsule or watch this one deal with vitreous prolapse and so we all learned from one another how to manage problems yeah that's been accelerated now now the neat part is yeah. can you imagine people can watch an HD video on their phone from right. anywhere on the planet and learn and, how to do it and that's and you you nailed it from the standpoint of why cataract lends itself so well to teaching it's because of the microscope and video yeah 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 well, we've got HD video right. we've got like for cataract coach I put up a new video every day now today's day 1765 or something so it's just like and there's, and there's no stopping there will be a new video every day hmm. as long as I'm alive as long as I can still do it but I think the amount of learning we do from each other People are almost surprised I say that I learn more from making those videos than I teach. You raise a very good point. I always, always tell people when they're new in practice and forever, always video your surgery. If it's a routine case, you may not care to watch it, but anything that's, that's abnormal, you're going to learn when you look at that video. For sure. And particularly for teaching and what have you. So I videoed every case in my career. Um, and, you know, as I said, I didn't always review them if it was routine. But, you know, in doing a lot of teaching, you're always looking for certain examples sure. of X, Y, or Z. And as you say, you learn so much by watching yourself operate. Yeah, of course. Right? And you learn so much by watching yourself in trouble and how you handled it and what other opportunities you might have. And while we're talking about OVDs, that's a great thing about OVD because it buys you time and it buys you space. So you can sit back. If you're in a complex situation, some OVD in the eye, say, what am I going to do next? As I say, viscoelastic is cheaper than vitreous. <laughs> yeah. Or, One of my or favorites. It's, yeah, or it's, it's always better to leave a little cortex than remove a little vitreous. I like that one, too. And, and by the way, um, while we're talking about OVD, of all of the quote-unquote miracles uh, in ophthalmology, what the industry has given to us, none is more important than the OVD. Sure. We could still all be doing extra cap. We could still all be putting contact lenses instead of implants. But if we didn't have OVDs, we wouldn't have the corneas we have today. For right. Sure. You yeah. could lots end of the old loss. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, OVDs have come a long way since the old days of yeah. HPMC, hydroxypropyl methylcellulose. Yeah. So neat stuff. And another analogy you gave earlier was about like the, the, the athletes. The athletes watch game day footage. How can you do surgery and not record the cases? Right. Because again, the, you can't predict when something will happen, and then the only way to learn from it is to go back and watch the game day footage and say, okay, you know what, I should have done this, that, and the other differently. Exactly. So, yeah. And it's what you said, it's just that goal of, I want to perfect every surgery. I want that Rex is so pretty that you don't, can't even tell where it started or finished. And it's that, that kind of mental drive to make sure every case is that beautiful. Right. And, and it may not bear heavily on the outcome of that case, but it makes you a better surgeon. Right. So the skills you develop you will use in a complex or complicated situation. Right, if you can become 1% better right. a week, 1.01 to the power of 52, right. that's a pretty huge improvement over the course of a year. I have no doubt. Yeah. So, but yeah, I think the other part is learning from colleagues and seeing other people in trouble and getting out of complications. There was a saying one, I'm, I'm stealing from someone, not sure who, but he said, there are only two types of doctors who don't get complications. Those who don't operate, those who lie about it. <laughs> You know, it's funny. I remember I was so nervous my first live surgery. Sure. I was in Germany. Uh, I think maybe this is 91 or something like that. Um, and I go to this meeting. It was in um, some northern Germany. I can't recall at the moment. Um, where they used to have the, the U-boats in, in World War II. And um, there was a, it was a wonderful guy and a great surgeon named Peter Brauweiler from Germany. Peter unfortunately passed away young, smoked like crazy and died of lung cancer. But Peter in surgery had a complication. He broke a capsule. And here's the live surgeon. Oh sure. my God, this and he was operating before I was. And now I'm really nervous. Now I'm really and he handled it beautifully. He handled the and he said he was very happy that this occurred intraoperatively sure. so that um, the, the audience, so to speak, the other doctors there, would learn how to manage it. They don't need to see routine cases. Right. I wanted them to see routine yeah. cases. Well, I also did live surgery in, in gosh, yeah. more than a dozen countries. Yeah. All over. It's stressful. Some people may not know, when you're doing live surgery, you've got, 
in one earpiece, your moderator trying to talk to you, hopefully about the step you're doing, not a different step you're doing. In your other earpiece, you have a, the, the director saying, okay, move your hand or send up the microscope. Well, I describe doing <clears throat> that kind of surgery, live surgery, I call it an away game. <laughs> and it's it's an away game. Yeah, someone else is all Just like the basketball floor bounces differently, or something like that. Things, the lighting is different, um, the scope is different, the chairs are different, and again, there's so much going on. Uh, you got somebody talking in your ear. It's, um, you know, some people don't believe in it. They say it's you know it's like throwing the Christians to the lions, um, but people want to see you fail. They want to see you have a problem. Well, it's like going to a car crash, going yeah. to a car race. You wouldn't yeah. mind seeing a crash as long as as long as no one gets seriously hurt. Yeah. So um, I I don't know I don't know if they, are they doing a lot of it's very expensive to do live yeah, surgery. I don't think they're doing it very much before. anymore. Yeah. The other thing you have to when you're in that host country, you got to figure out in the local language how do you say look at the lights. Yes. I still remember being in Italy and asking, how do you say this? So I could mm -hmm. interrupt, like, say, signora, por favore, guarda la luce, eh? You know, uh, <laughs> per favore. In oh, per, per, no, per, 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 per favore. Per favore, si, è vero. guarda la luce. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I learned how to operate in Russian, Vietnamese, yeah, you know, all these languages. Uh, um, but I'll tell you, it was a little bit different. I had one experience, this was remarkable. Uh, it was down in southern India, I think it was in Madurai, and they lined up a whole series of like bridge chairs and patients were sitting up. They were all dilated and they gave me a flashlight and I'm going around trying to find what I think is an appropriate case for teaching, right? And if I said yes, immediately behind me was somebody with a syringe to give a block, a block in the chair. Patient <laughs> sitting in the chair. I said yes, wham. <laughs> that wasn't thinking about the patient first. <laughs> That's not the kind of relationship when we were talking about earlier, yeah, <laughs> about know your patient. And, yeah. You've had some wild adventures, and you've probably talked uh, surgery in 50, 60, 70 countries. Oh, I, I, well, you know, also, since I did a lot of Zooms also, sure. and all over. I mean, I, I've got another Zoom coming up in Syria this week. So, uh, you know, it's really remarkable how Zoom came along at the same time as a pandemic. Sure. You talk about a match made in heaven. Yeah. Um, and look what Ike Ahmed did with, with Zooms in the beginning, oh, in the beginning of the stuff. pandemic, all over the world. So, I, you know, I, I no longer know how many countries in which I've taught. Um, but yeah, I've done, I've done surgery in lots and lots of places. And um, I think if, it, and it's the same thing about taking care of either complex patients some patients are complex, even if their eye isn't. A complex patient, a VIP, a complex problem, family member, what have you. If you can focus your attention, it's you and that eyeball, Sure. everything else is peripheral. And it's the same way you approach guest surgery. It's you and that eyeball. It's kind of compartmentalized. Exactly. Compartmentalized. You've set the patient up. Surgical ergonomics is everything. Patient's in a comfortable position. You're in a comfortable position then it's just you and that eyeball and you deal with those issues and you you know you forget whether it's you know uh an a-lister or your mother or whatever it's just the eye exactly so kind of get in that state of flow block it on everything else exactly. get in that state of flow and just focus right. and on that's the, the mental hand. aspect that's like the inner game of cataracts sure right? right don't think of don't ever think of anything else but that eyeball when you're operating Oh, for sure. I'm even old-fashioned. I don't even play music anymore. I like it quiet, focus only on the task at hand. Well, I, I over the years, I would change the music. Um, I played the music of the patient's youth. Oh, how smart is that? It, I started with playing big band. Oh, because of course. Yeah, yeah, because they were so. Let's talk about the greatest generation, sure. right? Those people, yeah. uh, or maybe older than that, they listened to big band music, World War II type music, that kind of stuff. And I played that for a number of years. And then we gradually, you know, moved on up to Clapton or what have you. Um, um, I, I never got to hip hop. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Not there yet. That wasn't the patient base. Um, one of our colleagues, a Russian surgeon, played Russian disco music in the room. Yeah. Thumpa, thumpa. And at a very loud volume. Yes, and I couldn't understand that. Yeah, I don't get it at all either. I, like it. I was raised in a library as a kid, so I just like it quiet. Uh, what about operating with lights on or off? I leave them on. Yeah. I, don't I did for a long time. I, I don't. So at some point I changed. I thought lights off were better. I think it is better. 
better contrast. Yeah, I just never really noticed yeah. the difference. I just tend to keep them on. <laughs> where, where do we go next in ophthalmology? What's coming down the pipe? Yeah. What's coming down the pipeline for us? Okay, well, as Hopefully I said, accommodating lenses. Okay, are you, ta are you talking about technique or technology? Both, yeah. anything. Um, again, I'm looking for, and if I knew what it was, I'd be a genius. I'm looking for the next phase of cataract surgery that doesn't look like what we do now. Whether you have a laser or some automated device that makes orexis and does, you know, nuclear removal or division or what have you, it's still basically the same type of surgery sure. we've done for a number of years. Um, you know, the, 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 the holy grail has always been the concept of emptying the bag through a small opening and filling it with a polymer that is clear and accommodating. And, um, you know, we've been talking about that for 40 years sure. and it hasn't materialized. Um, I think that technology may come, but what, I, what I'm thinking is, as I, we alluded to before, more and more automation, uh, maybe fewer and fewer ophthalmologists and technicians, um, optometrists, or some other willing provider, because as you say, we're four million lens-based sure. surgeries now. Um, if you look at the demographics, in this country right now, We've got about 60 million people between 55 and 85. That's going to go to 90 million by 2030. Oh, wow. Yeah. By 2030. That's in 10 years. Yeah, that's right. So just think about that. The sheer, this cataracts are going to go up by 60%. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So like six, seven million cataracts in a year. Oh, absolutely. And, and ophthalmologists who are retiring early because they got musculoskeletal right. problems, because they're burned out. You know, society has to start caring about physicians. The relationships have changed radically yeah. because, you know, in the old days, the doctors were driving Cadillacs and they were driving Mercedes, now they're driving Bentleys. People don't cry for the doctors. Sure. We don't have that relationship with the patient. And we need, we, need, we need the patients to be our advocates. Not only over years, we've been the patient advocates. We need patients to be our advocates because burnout and other wellness issues are going to really take us. How do we rebuild that? Oh, that's Absolutely. very, very difficult. That's very. It's so diff difficult to rebuild that because medicine's been dehumanized. Right. Um, this private equity business or other ownership of practices. Um, you take a look around uh, L.A. and you see all the buildings that now have UCLA on their name or Cedars on their name. Um, so that um, it's no longer a doctor and a patient. It's a corporation and a patient. Yeah. And the corporation has providers. Um, greed is at the center of it all. Bottom line, economics. I always felt that medicine should be excluded from that relationship, but we're now just a microcosm of the greed that you see in this country. Yeah, I always thought it was strange that when, you know, decades ago, it was just universities were centrally located, and that's where you sent the zebra cases, the unusual cases. Right. Now the universities have crept out with satellites out in the community, right. hiring new grads, paying them below market rate, just right. so they can, and even the patients. You ask the patient, well, who did your surgery? They say, oh, this hospital. I mean, no, no, which surgeon? Oh, I don't know, just that hospital. Right, exactly, I know. exactly. So, I, I, you know, I don't know how that's gonna change, but it's very evident to me that more and more technology is going to replace the traditional physician. Sure. I don't know how you're going to get, you know, when you get far enough down the line, how are you going to get the people who really can handle the problems if they've never been there before? I don't know, but I think we're moving toward mass treatment. Um, that's why you have everything is now, if it's not, if it's not been proven in the literature, um, everything is kind of cookbook medicine. And uh, the, the physician judgment, I'm not sure it's as good as, as doing evidence-based medicine, but evidence-based medicine, if the study isn't designed properly, doesn't give the right answer. I've seen too many ev evidence, too much evidence for that. But that's where we're going. But you're right, it's not all protocols. They just say, okay, patient has this, yeah. here's the criteria, here's exactly. the analysis, here's this, right. follow this path. And the physician judgment almost doesn't play a role. Right. And there's a lot of question. Um, there's a lot of question whether physician judgment is superior to evidence-based me medicine. And it's all based on what the subject is. It's not just 
you know, in general. You can't generalize anything. Everything's individual. So I think we're moving toward more technology, fewer physicians, um, uh, and again, maybe any willing provider. I think we're going to wind up training, if not in this country, in other countries, particularly countries like China, although they can probably develop enough ophthalmologists rapidly sure. enough, but they can train young people to do cataract surgery and handle their, their cataract blindness. But even yet, some of these you know, MSICS cataract camps, yeah. they're training non-ophthalmologists basically yeah. to just be a master of that one procedure. So I said you'd make yeah. one-trick ponies. Just as an example, in the UK for years, nurses have done uh, laser capsulotomies. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, yeah. And tell me, you couldn't teach a high school kid to do a laser capsulotomy? It's the, it's the first thing you teach a brand new first year resident. <laughs> July of your first year resident, <laughs> let me teach you how to do YAG capsulotomy. Right. So, I mean, so you don't need to spend 13 years in training, as Tom points out, yeah. um, to learn how to do that. So the, the nurses, you know, in the NHS system, it's all about economics sure. and time and volume and what have you. So nurses are trained to do YAG lasers. And all the individual injections, too. <laughs> Are they doing them as well? Yes, because that's just an ejection, right? Nurses can do an ejection. It just happens to be uh, right. in your eye, in your vitreous. Right. So, but maybe I, we'll have like the UK then, where 93% of patients use the nationalized health right. service and 7% do boutique pay out of pocket. Well, you raise a very important subject, and that is that our, we have the most convoluted healthcare delivery system in the world. And we have a de facto two tier system now where you mentioned concierge medicine. Um, we are going to a two-tier system, there's no question. As I see the, the future for Medicare, and people can stare and throw daggers at sure. me, we're going to what they call Medicare Advantage for all, eventually. So Medicare HMO, basically? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, a, an HMO concept where everyone will be covered, sure. but it's going to be the Advantage type, it's not going to be the fee-for-service type. And that's and you, you'll lose physicians that way, you'll have more technicians you'll have physician assistants, you'll have nurse practitioners. Um, I, I, that's how I see the future. How is it be, uh, to be frank, you have an aging society, you have an explosion of technology. We're already, what, 18, 19% of GDP and not everyone's getting care. Correct. So how else are you gonna care for an aging, aging growing population? You have to have universal health care. Um, Physicians don't like to hear this, and I'm glad my career is done. <laughs> You're already out. You're <laughs> but, done. But, but, but this is this is what I see the future, and I don't know when the future is going to happen. Um, but to not have health care for all is, is absurd to me. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I, I I'm not a Bernie Sanders fan, but I agree with him on that one. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. The tough part too is that if you look at some of the, you know, the, the lobbying that. Pharma does it so effective, like just an intramitral injection. Mm -hmm. The retina specialist with 14 years of training gets $100 to do the injection. Mm -hmm. The drug itself is $1,900. That's a 95 to 5% split. Right, and there are new programs now that are designed with these equivalent drugs or what have you, where the retina surgeon is not going to make the money on the drugs. The patient's going to buy the drug and bring it to the retina sure. surgeon, or it's going to be delivered to the pharmacy or what have you to where the surgeon's being taken out of that formula. Um, so, you know, uh, back to the situation of having a two-tiered system. So ultimately, we're going to have a Medicare for all at some point sure. down the road. It'll be managed care type, and then a lot of people who have money will opt out. And I don't know if the physicians like today, you, I mean, I opted out of Medicare for the last number of years in my practice. Whether you'll be allowed to do it, whether you have to give a certain amount of time to public care, I don't know. Oh, wow. Well, that happens in some countries. You yeah. must practice uh, public medicine a certain amount of time, either a certain number of years or a certain number of hours, and then you can practice private medicine. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a big ask, especially when you're asking those 13 years of training. I mean, for eight of them, you're right. paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in tuition. In those countries, the, the most of those um, physicians are trained in public schools. 
mean, here we have this really absurd dichotomy of people going half a million dollars in debt yeah. to go for their education, and then to work in corporate medicine and, and you know have little to no chance of paying that back. I mean, we're in a crisis in this country in terms of medicine. I mean, the burnout um, is is a real problem, and the the most significant contributing factor to burnout is loss of physician autonomy. Oh, totally agree with you there. Yes. Dealing with the bureaucracy, the admin, exactly. the grief, that has nothing to do yeah. actually with patient care. I'll tell you, that this is this came home, this has stayed with me and I've told this story a lot. My wife Barbara needed a, an orthopedic procedure or back surgery and she had to see someone to do her pre-op, not her regular doctor. So there's somebody that the group uses. Okay. So she goes to see this guy, and this seems like a very nice man. They starting this conversation, and he's older. And at some point, he laments to her that he used to have a practice and took care of people and on and on. And now all he's doing is clicking his way through life with the EMR oh, system. Click, click, click. That's all. He's clicking his way through life. That hit me like a ton of bricks. We always worked with scribes, so even so, when we did paper charts, I had a scribe write the notes, and then when we went to EMR, we still have scribes who make the entries so that you can deal with the patient. You can also see more patients, sure. by the way. Um, so I always believe very, very firmly in doom. But what has happened to physicians just looking at a computer screen and not the patient, it's horrible for both. It's just horrible. Right, the patient's sitting here, right. the surgeon's a physician's here at a computer just clicking exactly. away, back of the head toward the patient. I, I saw a kind of a joke on that. I can't forget who the colleague was. He put a mask of his face on the back <laughs> of his head for a video. <laughs> Talking about this. So, well, I guess brave new world coming up. We'll have to see how this all pans out. But the good part is we still got cataract surgery. I love cataract surgery. So, I mean, I hate to tell you, I, I probably do it for free, right? Go on these charity trips, we do it for free. Um, listen, we have a foundation. I, I raise money so we can do free surgery. Yeah. I mean, just think about that. Um, it comes down to this, and this is another thing for the young people. I was a fourth year medical student, and it was early in the fourth year. I was going to be a chest surgeon. I was playing touch football in Central Park okay. uh, across from Sinai. I got hit in the left eye with a football and got a hyphema. They put me in bed on the Zell wing, which is where we had the ophthalmology wing. Uh, in those days, bilateral patches, I was there for 10 days. And I was listening, I was in a room with two other beds, and I listened to the residents making rounds sure. with the attendings. I'm fascinated by it, because my exposure had been nil to that point in medical school. So I went to our chief, and I said, you know, I have an elective coming up at the end of my year. I think I'd like to spend that time in ophthalmology and get more about it. I'd already signed my first year of a seven-year chest surgery training program. And after the two and a half, I just thought this is what sold me on ophthalmology because we didn't have imaging, but we had the Goldman lens. You could see everything. You could see everything with that Goldman lens. Yeah. And I just, I was agape. I was so fascinated that you could see the pathology because I said, the cardiologist was king because... Hearing these little mighty yeah, clicks. Of we things. didn't have, I mean, we, we had an EKG. I don't even think we had echoes then. Yeah. So, so we didn't have any of the imaging, but we had a Goldman lens, and you could see the retina. It was just fascinating. So I went back to my chief, and I said, you know, I think I really want to do ophthalmology instead of chest surgery. And he said, only do it if it challenges you intellectually and you want it to be your life. Otherwise, it's just going to become a job. And that stayed with me. And uh, I don't know if the passion I have for it is because of his stimulation, but it challenged me intellectually. And okay. that's why I've yeah. done so much research. That's why I've published so much, because I'm challenged by it. I want to know about the dead bag. All right? I want to know those oh, that's things. such great advice. Yeah. Boy, great. Thank, thank goodness you were hit in the eye by the football and got a high fever. <laughs> Change your life. I, it's serendipity of life. It is the serendipity of life. Like Absolutely. you said earlier, yeah. life is what happens to you when you're trying right. to you're too busy trying to plan for it. Exactly. Wow, Sam, I had a fantastic interview with you. Thank you so much for doing this podcast. This was a lot of fun. Wasn't this great? It was much easy. more fun than I thought it would be. This was great. <laughs> and thank you for being such an incredible mentor to me over the years. 
including now. And no, I do jokingly say that I am the resident who broke Sam Maskin, only because after he attended me, he stopped attending residents. So I just felt guilty that maybe I said something, maybe I did something wrong. Well, the, the truth is I really appreciate what you are bringing to people. You've created a great teaching model. And I think mentoring is everything, which is why we have a fellowship. I'm involved in minority mentoring in the academy. And so I think mentoring is just everything. You must pass the baton. And for people who are getting on in years, don't forget that. Pass the baton. At your peak. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for enjoying that podcast with me. I trust that you learned a lot and it was well worth the small time investment. We're going to have more podcasts coming. We have next weekend, next Sunday, is one more, the very final one of our curriculum series, part 25. And now that we're done with the curriculum series, starting later this month, every Sunday, we're going to have a brand new podcast for you for the whole year. A lot of great material. Remember, you can also listen to these podcasts audio only while you're driving to work or exercising in the gym. They're available on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, anywhere you find your podcasts. Check it out and please subscribe.